What up, dogs? It's your boy, Mike Mason, here to do another edition of Fireside Chat. Uh, we got an awesome show up ahead tonight, you guys. Uh, if you didn't see the thumbnail or if you're just tuning in late, uh, we have a coffee cup with a beautiful pipe on the handle. Uh, man, it's really cool by Hick Dog, who uh, is, is a friend of the show, been with us before. Um, I'm really excited about that. I, uh, I have a co-host with me, uh, the beautiful Carrie Strope that I wanted to introduce before we get started. Hello, cheers, <laughs> the, the beer goddess, as beer. it were. Yes, that's true. Yes, she just <laughs> ran to the store to, to, to get some beer. And yes, she really is. She is a beer goddess and a glass goddess. You are an educator uh, and incredible uh, worker of glass, especially fused, uh, warm glass process, cold glass process. Well, You're well. awesome. It's yeah, great to have you here with me. Thanks for joining thanks, us. Frank, thanks for the glowing introduction. Yeah, Appreciate of course. It. Hell yeah. <laughs> um, guys, uh, I wanted to talk just about a few things before we jump into this demo. Um, uh, we just got back from the Champs Glass Games, the summer glass games, as it were. Uh, these are qualifying rounds for the Masters, which you guys may have seen some of the demos from, and then we did the special last year. Um, there'll be one for this year, too. Um, but the Atlantic City Games and the Summer Games are like qualifying rounds, uh, and those can get you into the Masters in February, which is basically everybody who's won uh, battling it out in a two-day competition versus just smaller games. Um what we're going to see tonight, Hick Dog uh, competed in the multifunction category. And this was a challenge to make uh, a functional piece that had an, a different function. And he made it an absolutely incredible vacuum coffee maker uh, that also part of it was this coffee mug that had a pipe on the side. And man, it's just uh, super classic stuff. We'll talk about that shortly and, and we'll watch that go down. It was really cool. Um, the games were incredible. Uh, so many neat pieces come together. Uh, Carrie was there filming with me, so we've got like 10 shows worth of stuff to share. It's going to be really great. Um, so much cool stuff, man. The Judge Punny, he even jumped on at one point, so we've got a Punny demo for you guys. Like, there's just so much to share. Um, uh, there's a couple, just a few things I wanted to chat about for, for the homies. Uh, news type of stuff. Um... I mentioned last time we spoke that, that we were going to uh, do the Melt Away Hunger thing again this year. Um, that That's happening again. Uh, the details, uh, we posted them in the Torch Talk group and on my Instagram and all that. I did just definitely, definitely wanted to remind you guys uh, to participate in that. And then if you donate, uh, every five bucks is an entry, a chance to win an $1,100 Torch Level ticket. Um, it's just like, I, I called it a no brainer cause man, you know, every five bucks generates a ton of meals for people in need. Feeding America is completely legit, a highly rated charity that really does use their scale, uh, to get way more meals out of every dollar. I, I'm super proud to be involved with them. Um, you guys know, I, I also work with them on the sticker pack stuff and yeah they're just a great organization totally legit and yeah so every five bucks you kick to them uh is a chance to win and yeah uh, i don't know like the comparison i make every year is that like man any lottery you enter is gonna have like thousands you know to one odds and this is like hundreds to to one odds or more you know yeah, less these odds are great yeah, you're not gonna find odds like this on any other. Yeah, I get I get distracted. Did you also mention the the matching thing, the Tony Robbins matching? Yeah, well, we always try to take advantage of these matching campaigns, and that's what the link is at the bottom. It's not like a crazy tracking thing or anything. It just takes you to a really cool campaign that's going on right now that uh, doubles meals with a sponsor, and then through the end of July, he's actually tripling meals. And uh, that's something that I like. I take advantage of as well. When, when there's a promotion like this, it just it makes your impact uh, more and more and more. So that's the preferred link if you want to donate this month. And yeah, for real, it's it's super easy. Share this this flyer. Um, 
on social media. It's on my Instagram, which is also in the video description. And yeah, I mean, East Coast Melt, you guys, the lineup is tremendous. It's, man, what a time. Even if you can't make it, yo, even if you just want to enter, you can give this away yourself. You can really do whatever you want with this. So you know what I mean? You could make a friend's dream come true by just kicking a random five or ten bucks in to Feeding America, which is definitely going to help some homies in need. That sort of thing. So I'm asking for every random donation I can get here. Even if you can't come to East Coast Melt, I'm sure that you know somebody who can make their dream come true, you know, or just feed some homies. I mean, you really can't go wrong with, with five bucks on this. Um, that's, that's, that's all I'll say on that for now. It's just a really cool thing, man. We've, we're coming up on like like 35,000 meals or something. I forget. It was like 18,000 meals we did one year and like 19,000 meals another year. And then this year, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, that we can smash that again. So if any of you guys can get just if it can kick some bucks in and take roll the dice on that one, baby. A um, couple other things I wanted to mention here. Just news, man. Uh, tomorrow, this is going down. Um, Emilio Santini, one of our uh, maestros out there who's come over here and shared so much. He's somebody who was kind of the conduit for the teachings of uh, Cesare Toffolo. And his uh, demos that are on Corning are, are just really fundamental stuff on flame working. Um, I, I, you know, these classes, each one he just, he drills how to pull a point, you know, how to inflate it, how to twist things up, how every one of his demos is critical and a different thing so i'm hoping that this next one is going to be critical as well so i did just want to let you guys know about that um i'm going to use these segments here in the beginning to bring you guys up to speed on stuff that i think is important and this is definitely important um slightly less important but this really melted my heart today Aww. uh the homegirl amanda uh, from the corning museum shot me a picture from his classroom and uh, th this was on the board there, and he was uh, recommending people that homies in the class should check out. And then Lichio at Bacos, some point they... Cesare Toflo, Constantini, Shane yeah. Farrow, Lauren Stump even, and somebody, what? Somebody threw a Mike Rahman, and, and then somebody, I guess, either somebody was the saying Torch Talk there. It's just what a nice thing to see that, uh, that, that out there in Santini's class, somebody I've mentioned so often, and... You know, I mean, he showed up that I've spent one of my first real classes was a week with Matt Escookie and, and uh, Santini is one of Matt's uh, real first teachers, uh, proper instructors. And he showed up and gave us a guest lesson on a stemware one day. So, man, I just I think so highly of him. And that was such a such a cool thing to see. So anyways, uh. Yo, what else? Uh, yo, shout out to everybody. I'm not going to do the whole thing where we got to watch the Patreon video again. I just wanted to take a moment to thank a bunch of you guys uh, signed up. I really appreciate that. Um, the support, it, it means a lot. When, when when this bad boy hits two and three hundred, I, I really, I've got some big ideas and things that we can do with, with these funds beyond just getting to every show and, and covering the shit out of them. So yeah, I really appreciate the support on my mission from Glass God. So fuck yeah. And on that note, um, I think let, let's pop this off. I think It'd be be a good time to do it. Glass Central Station. Everything I do is Glass Central Station. You guys, it's made possible by these companies. Uh, the flow has come on. Huge respect. Uh, Fam is coming up uh, next month. A big event. We'll probably talk about them after the demo. GTT, there I use them all the time. Mountain Glass now coming at you from both coasts. This is a great company. Glass Vegas, another great event, man. I, I love covering that show. And High Volume, Kerry works there. I run the High Volume for like five years. We're in High Volume country. <laughs> Lampwork supplies you. the shit. <laughs> Bethlehem burners, you know, awesome torches. Champs, that's where we're gonna see tonight. And North Star Glass Works. Virtually everything I use these days is North Star. And Dopals, man, the homie. Griffin Glass, the homie too, pitching and helping out. And then these cats and you guys. It means a lot. I I I, I couldn't do this without the support. So here we go. Let, let's watch the the fruits of y'all's labor or contribution at least. And then the homie had to set the mood, set the tone, lighten up some sage. 
And realize you lit it with a hot glass. Yeah, um, yeah, you lit that up and then uh, and then check this out, guys. Right into the shit. Okay. He had that tube already heated up before he got here. Did a little mash of solid black. And now he just sealed that right to that hole that was open. So I didn't get there late. He just, he already had that, that uh, blank heated up. And this was the first thing that he did. So it was already open, but that's what he did. He took that black, got it a little hot, and then mashed it down. And this is a trick I learned from Big Z, actually. But uh, here it is. It's, it's um, just another way to do lip wraps. You know, you can trail them on with a stringer. You know, there's all these ways to go about it. But this way is adding this solid glass and then essentially tubulating it. He's letting it cook back a bit and then giving it air and basically letting it kind of almost like you would do with a disc flip or something, you know? You let that cook back and flatten out and boom. And then as long as you heat it evenly, look like there was even a little crack there if you guys saw that, just a tiny crack it appeared in the tube because like I said, he just started going on this shit. And uh, anyways, so on, on that uh, lip wrap trick here, He's added that puck and he's just letting it cook back and even back and giving a little little puffs of air. And if you do this right with it really evenly hot, the air is just going to puff out right through the middle. It's the same kind of trick you do if you want to do like a raised color carb on a spoon. You can add that dot of color and then heat it and blow it out, you know, kind of. And when it blows out, if it blows out right, you get a raised, you know, color around the lip of your carb. Same kind of deal here, but it's done on the opening of a hole. And now he's going to pop that bad boy, and then hopefully when it pops, if it pops in the middle, there's going to be an even amount of black glass distributed around the edge there. Facilitating this lip wrap. And now he's going to ream that out. And yeah, so when he connects up to this to do the other side of the cup, that little puck of glass is going to become the, the thin, tiny band of black that, that you saw maybe in the thumbnail. That's so it. cool. Right. It's a fun trick for doing these lip wraps. Some people are just not as comfortable with that stringer method. I, I think this is a perfectly valid method. I know some people will do this method over and over and over again, you know, and they get those little those super thin lines over and over on top, stacked on top of one another. So here goes the Encalmo uh, to the other blank that he'd already already had, like, ready to go. They're allowed to bring certain things in a box. So he brought some blanks that were just opened up or whatever. Yeah, I think it's like a 6-inch by 6-inch by 6-inch box or something like that for prep. Yeah, and then I think it might be allowed some certain prep or whatever. There's specific rules for each thing. Yeah. This was within it. So, yeah, he got those connected. And I think the, the trick here is to really just let these uh, flow together without that line getting out of whack. And, uh, you know, Hick Dog's got some pretty, what I'd call, trained hands. He's been doing this over 20 years. And he's a guy who, like, really works hard. You know, he's in the studio day in and day out. So this is one of those type of moves where, you know connect it up and roll and he's able to trust his muscle memory on this to let this all condense down and nothing's going to get too far out of whack that can be a little trickier if you're not accustomed to hollow work but mike what type what size tube do you think you started with here uh that's a good question you know it's probably like a 32 or a 38 and then that color one is probably closer to the 32 or somewhere around there 28 Okay. Yeah, these these weren't uh, giant blanks. Not like his other project, right? <laughs> yeah, no, no. A lot of his stuff is like super scale sculpture. And, you know, he's really known for like the large format dragons or whatever, not to make the, the <laughs> joke, but you know, I can't resist that shit, baby. Um, no, but, uh, I, you know, fun fact. Uh, Hick Dog told me that uh, he actually came up with Steve Size Love, you know, who's like a kind of a classic Venetian style, um, you know, kind of cup maker. Now he does all this cool air trap stuff and, you know, feminine sculpture stuff and all that. But I mean, one of the reasons I started doing this 
was because of this cute video that Steve Sizelove has that was on like an HGTV show. And it's like, stay at home dad, Steve Sizelove uh, oh, makes a goblet. And he does like a, he demonstrates like a stick stack and then he makes like a really nice goblet for some kind of wedding or whatever out of it. And, you know, I, I'm a single parent uh, with full custody of my daughter. Um, now she's older and, and that's changed, but for like, you know, about 16 and a half years, I raised her alone. And, uh, you know, so back in 2013, that to me was really inspirational. And anyways, um, Hick Dog, he came up with Steve Size Love, who is, you know, this really, really you know, excellent cup maker. And uh, so that's kind of the basis of, of where he started. And he's known for this totally different thing now, but his, his work is rooted in classic cup making, actually. So I thought that was interesting. It was I've, I, we've talked a lot and I've filmed him quite a bit, but that was something I hadn't learned. Uh, excuse me to this point. So here he has condensed that other side of the uh, glass and and puffed that out, kind of against uh, the diameter of the other one. So as you can see, that area in between that was this you know gulf is now kind of condensed in and been puffed out and done in, in a controlled way such that you know we have a somewhat even uh, bubble there on the other side well now he's going to condense back the, the other side and puff it out as well so you know how you get there there's like 10 different ways to go about this and different um, artists are going to go about it different ways but you know for him and it, it's kind of this classic style of you know, making that connection and the, and then bringing them out and then, the, you know, and then shaping the cup. It's at this point, it's almost like a, a pretty straightforward blank that he can now uh, do a bit more shaping and whatever it's going to be. But yeah, uh, just just fun to watch how he condensed that glass back and took it from this, you know, 28 or 30, whatever, two millimeter diameter. Now it's out to the diameter of the other tube. It's much more squat. The walls are relatively even. You can still see there's still like that band hasn't fully come in yet, but he's going to get it now. So it's just a matter of like, you know, bringing that out and then bringing the sides out, bringing that out and then bringing the sides out and then bringing that out for a final shaping. You know, it's kind of a rough shaping. It's not rough in terms of the material distribution. I think that that's what is important here is keeping all the walls even as this condenses. And even here, he's kind of letting this condense and, you know, is likely giving it a little puff as he goes here and there. And using the Marver to help keep this thing. He's probably giving it this, these little puffs as he's rolling against that Marver. And now look at that. The walls have taken on that exact taper that was hitting. And, you know, it, if he had done that too fast... It just there's no way he could have gotten there with even walls and all these sections so you know it's it's a matter of making those moves you know in in uh, gradually so that each side is out to the diameter that he wants before he goes in for that final uh, move against the marver you know and tries to round out uh, the encalmo band so that i think that's what facilitated that coming out cleanly Tommy in chat was wondering how you're liking Nebraska, if you're not, you know, narrating anything. <laughs> yeah, Nebraska's not bad. I've got a dope taco place and a dope pizza place. Mostly I just sit in my room and edit video. But, you know. Okay, so here is removing material from the end. I think we might get a handle switch here. We might, I think you might open it up to uh, accept the milli coin. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, is what's going to happen here. Sorry. So yeah, if you saw the thumbnail, uh, there's one of these really cool dragon eye millies that he did, which is like kind of like almost like a hybrid Franchini and then stacked pull or something is what it looks like. Um, so he's opening that up, puffing it out first to remove material, so we got a nice clean opening there. 
And then here's this Millie. That's like a really crazy dragon eye. Almost like a, what I'd call like an artistic dragon eye, you know? It looks almost like a painting or something as opposed to like these uh, natural style dragon eyes that, that I like to make. Um, so check it out. He's got uh, this rod that's going to lens it up really hot. And that face is just starting to glow, as you can see. Just, just hot enough that it'll take all that clear without bitching or trapping air. So now that bad boy's got a nice uh, lens on it there. And I think that he was uh, trying to do the uh, famous Dapo, uh, like, flex and snap. But I don't think uh, he, he was able to set a, a firm enough stress line in there for that to work. So Dapo came over with the, these nippers that were... Pretty fucked up. I used him over at the uh, Starship, actually. I'm gonna check this out. He got a big old, like, score on it, and then, ding, tap, tap, tap. Magic. So, yeah, that, that was uh, Daniel Porte there with a potentially illegal assist. I'm not certain. No, I'm just oh, kidding. No. <laughs> it's all good. It's, it's kind of more of a tool borrowing. Okay, so here he goes, getting the other side. I think this is gonna be the back end. But they're both clear, so you kind of have a, a choice to make. You know, you can see which one got a cleaner lensing. But typically, it's you know, you're going to lens and clear and then back it. Back it with the color, that is. Back that thing up. <laughs> Bust out in song here. Call me Big Millie, won't you back that coin up? <laughs> right. All right, all right, all right. We just lost 10 viewers, Mike, thanks. Mm. That's a good thing I wasn't acting out the glass bitching when it got covered by that clear. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of touching me already? I'm just going to crack off you. What? <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's, uh, that is what the glass does if you... Yeah. <laughs> Touch it when it is not ready. So yeah, he's removing some of this this clear here. A little aggressive. I'm gonna assume this is the back. He may have decided not to uh, fuck with the backing after all. Hick Dog was traveling. He was he had hoped to join us tonight, but wasn't in the cards. But big shout outs to Hick Dog. I would have asked him what had happened there, because it looked like he was gonna do something with the clear there. But maybe he just wanted a full on thing to pull it down from so it pulled down evenly. Hard to say. And then this was neat. He uh, pulls down a little bit of like pulls it down to like four mil or something. And then does this coil around to give it an extra backing. Flex and bend, is that what you had said earlier about the... Uh, oh, it's like, I forget the, the, the name of it now. Like stick and snap, is flex and bend just bigger? It's or? not, it's, um, it's like less aggressive than a stick and snap. Hmm. Yeah, let me see if I can find it. Fuse and flex, he calls it. It's his take on the stick and snap. It's called, he's okay. like, fuse, isolate heat to allow to flex, and then direct stress until the surface splits. Cool and snap, then lens. He posted a video of it to Torch Talk on May 11th. So if you search Torch Talk for fuse and flex, you'll bring up a video of it in, in the okay. Torch Talk group. So yeah, shout outs to Daniel. We actually have a video uh, that Carrie shot of him and PJ uh, doing their piece 
uh, which took like second place in the mystery collab. And here is using a marble mold to kind of get some initial uh, flattening on that without having to be too aggressive on it and like mash that back cone in. Now he's going to get a bit more aggressive and kind of make it into a more of a flat uh, coin. It was already a coin, you know, but now it's going to really get aggressively flattened out. And with all this backing glass and all this lens glass, it's going to allow him to make it into this flat thing. And, and hopefully with the right heat and everything, the, the image inside is not really going to distort. It's just going to expand. So that's kind of the idea here. He's got this nice lens glass on it that's protecting the front. The back has now been slathered in this uh, black. And then give it that gentle push, you know, from the edges. And then now he's giving it the... And he's using the uh, the face of, it's like doing a Maria almost. He's got, you know, both sides of that Elmarver hitting it on the front. And then the back is really getting pushed out. So now the shape of this has changed from, you know, to, to being much more squat. And this is getting a lot closer to a puck that he can now seal into the bottom of that cup. Which is what we're going to see happen next. Looked like he was just filling in a little tiny spot there on the uh, the backing. And now, yeah, again, just giving it the, these push outs. If he were to just like really get it get it ripping and push that in in one move, that's where you'd start distorting that face. You know, he's just taking his time with that, not not uh, being too aggressive. And I think that last one was really just to flatten out that part that he'd had uh, cooked in. And yeah, this thing, when you look at it in the bottom of the cup, it, it really looks cool. It gets puffed out even more, you know, as part of the cup once it's sealed in there. But it, it's just neat to see that that section of cane get expanded so much and still retain the, the, the image and he wasn't twisting the cane at all right it was just no he, was he wasn't it twisting it uh -uh. he was adding a backing to it which maybe made it look like yeah. he was twisting it at some point. well when he was pulling out the back it didn't matter as much the cane is somewhat opaque mm-hmm At that point, that didn't matter as much. That part's pretty much covered by the black, and you can't see through it. So now he's got the black, which is going to be the underside of the cup. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so when you look in the cup, you're seeing the eye. Drink to the bottom of your coffee cup, and then your eyes are open. You see the eye. And, and then... Yep, yes. <laughs> that that was the... Uh, that's exactly what he told me he meant by that. <laughs> intuitive mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't it have been ironic if he would have put eyelids on it and it was half closed mm. yeah mm -hmm. right i'm sorry i'll stop there <laughs> yes yes yeah. now um now this uh, he's got the hole open to the same diameter and he's kind of setting it in there to, uh that didn't go perfectly. The The end of it, the lip, was a little too hot, I think. And, like, when he connected it to the back, the other side flexed in a little bit. So it connected further in on the face. And, like, it's no big deal. It, now we get to watch him, you know, deal with that, which takes a minute because he's got to, like, you know, get that glass to move out to the edge and cook in and, and you know, even itself out without fucking everything else up. So Cake Dog's the master. He pulls this shit off and yeah, like it's totally it fine. Like nothing, yeah. And what it makes me think of, guys, it reminds me of this methodology when I learned with Mike Nan. Uh he goes, um he's got this trick thing or this is teaching methodology. Uh he calls it 40-40-20. And guys, if you're not familiar, he's 
one of the best scientific glass workers. He does absolutely huge work. It's Merge Scientific, if, if that name rings another bell for you. Really, really amazing uh, glass worker. And the way he teaches this thing about doing seals, he, like I said, it's called 40-40-20. And the idea here is that when you do a seal, um, the first 40% of your work is getting these holes open. Uh, they should be flush. They should have an even wall. Basically, all that preparatory stuff that you're doing to make them match, you know, and, and get ready. That's 40% of your work, right? And... If you don't do a 40, if you don't nail that, like if our, if all those factors I mentioned aren't proper, like let's say that, you know, the walls are even, you know, the holes, you know, but one of them's not exactly round or one of them has a little bit of a thicker wall, it makes it more tricky in your next step. And your next 40% is getting them stuck and getting that initial, initial seal made. So... If you've only done 35% or 30% in the first step, uh, now your next step is carrying that. Now you've got to do 50% of your work on that next step just to stay in the game. And that means that when you go to do the stick, it's going to be more tricky or it's not going to be possible to get a perfect stick on it. Now you're going to end up with this. So in this case, he did a good job. The first 40 was solid, but the next 40 where he went to do the stick, that didn't go so hot. So that let's call that 25% or something on the next one. And and what happens is your the last 20% of this equation should just be cleaning it up. Like the last 20% of your work on a ring seal or this or that should just be chasing it around with the hand torch and you know giving a little puff out to even those walls out or whatever it'll be. And and if you do your job right, that's really just 20% of it. Just that quick, you know, the walls come together, you give them a little puff, man, everybody's fucking happy, and, and we call it a day. It's safety break time. Uh, in this case, that's not happening. And now in um, the cleanup step here, he has had to do much more work. You know, instead of just a quick torching, you know, to even out that wall where it connected, he has had to, to flatten that thing out. He's had to connect a thicker handle to give him a hand enough a weight on it to, to bring that, that glass in the middle in and really puff it out. And he just had to move much more glass around to get that thing even. It's still not quite there, but it's getting a lot closer. He's got a more solid handle on it now. Now he's really going to be able to even that out. In the end, you're not going to see really a thing of this because it's going to all even out. But it's just that idea. And in this case, we're looking at an example of 40% sure on the first part. That was fine. But, man, I mean, you'd be lucky to call that 20 on the next one because he really had a big chunk of the wall didn't connect. So, that just left a lot more work to do in the cleanup. And, and like I said, the, the more smaller scale reasonable example is your ring seal. You know, you've got your holes even and all that, and you stuck them just right. And then, yeah, it should really just be a quick hand torch and just 20% of your work. So, it's just something to think about. Um... Think you know. Think about how much of your work you're you're give you're leaving yourself in the next step. You know, as you think about these seals and how to prepare them, because really having holes and all that even and properly done and proper wall weights and all that just make the next step easy. And when that goes well, it makes the next step easy. So that's a that's the forty forty twenty. And that was, in my mind, that's what I was thinking of. I was like, man, what a great example of 40-40-20 where the second 40 didn't go perfect. But in the end, the shit looks really nice. It just, it took them a good bit longer to, to work that difference out where it hit the sides. So, and you know, sometimes it's a little reassuring to see that that, that not everything goes perfect for, for, for even bosses like Hick Dog. But the difference is that, you know... So that's that saying. It's not what, what you uh, can make, it's what you can save. And here, he just just needed a little bit of extra time. Again, a critical thing there was that he switched his handle. I'm not certain he would have needed to switch that handle right away if that seal had gone perfectly. Um, but now look at this. That thing is sealed in there. You really cannot tell that, that he went off the, the grid a bit there with, with the, the, the initial seal. So he's giving it a look. We're all like, all right, all right. Fuck yeah. <laughs>
And now he's uh, setting up to do a like a hot seal to the bottom. Um, you know, cups like this. Co correct me if you know, or somebody else might be good enough. But what I've found and what I've discussed with with other cup makers, I've had the opportunity to learn this stuff with with you know Escuki and and a bit with Santini and then uh, Roger Paramore is probably the the. The cup maker, you know, has really influenced me a lot. But um, on, on that seal there in the bottom, if you do a cold seal there, you've got like like 10 seconds tops to flash it before the bottom of your cup cracks. Especially if you've got a thicker bottom on your cup, which is ideal. You know, you don't want some thin-ass bottom on a cup, right? So it's just pretty imperative in my mind, um, unless you're really one of these maestros who can do that little seal, you know, and get the top open and be perfect about it. Um, I think a hot seal on the bottom there. And then, okay, what he just did, he sealed it and then he went into the crux of the Elmarver and I think he was like pushing it and feeling for straightness. When you go to open a cup, it is just so important that your handle on the other side be straight. I mean, if you do it in the tool, it's important that the tool is straight, whatever it'll be. Because even if you're if you're using a tool, if you're um, doing a flame cut, however you choose to open that cup, like it really doesn't matter. All the methods involve being on center. So that's what he's doing here. He's feeling that this thing is on center. Don't even worry about any differences in the wall. He's about to fix that shit. He just had to condense a bit of it back to get that coin to condense in properly because of the troubles or whatever <laughs> but um he's gonna fix that shit now especially now that he's see he's taking his time to really get this thing centered because now he'll puff the rest out that middle there's a little bit of a kink but that's gonna be gone here shortly don't worry about that just watch the man do his thing it's just so important to start centered so he's got a hot seal on the back really really centered so now that handle is like lathe geared and so now he's going to go in here and fix this, straighten this all out. So yeah, um, it's just so important to have straight handles. And that trick where he puts it in the Elmarver, that gives you this length to, to keep your tube or rod against. And you'll see and feel that it's straight. And uh, other workers like to have a tooling roller right there. Like Kiva Ford is constantly using his like little tooling roller to do the same trickery. Where he's spinning it in that tooling roller and watching to see. And if there's anything off, he's able to straighten it. So that way he's always working basically laid straight. And I mean that dude, his work is just so shockingly clean. And that's an aspect of it. Part of it is that he trained his hands. And, you know, part of it is that he's, um, he really works straight. He takes the time to make sure that everything is perfect before he proceeds through a shaping step. He's always got that tooling uh, roller there. He even produced his own line of them or whatever. And God forbid you ever see him sell those shits, buy one. Because you'll want it later, now or later you'll want it. Or one of your friends will want it. So, yeah, um... I think he wanted to really uh, clean up that handle connection there. Why he took that handle off is one of those questions I would have asked him if he was here with us. Next time. Yeah, right. I think he may be able to join us when we do part two of this because he made a vacuum coffee maker. If you guys have ever seen one of these, it has like a flask below. Um... And then they connect to a chamber above that has a tube that goes down. You use a little, like, a burner. It's kind of and, a percolator, isn't it? Well, it's not so much a percolator as that it, it the vacuum pressure difference, when the bottom chamber gets heated and the water boils, the pressure difference makes it go up into the top where it, it uh, just chills with the, you know, and, and in theory, the temperature at which that happens is very close to the ideal temperature for making coffee. So it goes up by vacuum pressure into this top chamber. Um, hmm. Yeah, at the, just the right temperature. And then as it cools, 
it pulls it right back down because that pressure changes because the burner is now off and the bottom chamber starts to get cold. So its pressure returns to normal, the same pressure that it was, you know, like when it started before the flame even went on, right? So it pulls that shit right back. And, and then now you've got a, a pot of coffee. And I, I put a clip of that in here at the end so you guys will actually get to see it in action. But that's a whole nother part of this demo that involves all sorts of awesome stuff. And I thought that the pipe cup was, was one that you guys out there would really enjoy first. So this is like, um, you know, the champs after party. And I, I thought this would make a really great demo for it. We have some killer, killer, killer stuff coming. Um, I'll pull out my spreadsheet and give you guys a little peek into the future of, of the preview. hall. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, coming up, um, you yeah, know, we got Punty, like I mentioned. He was the judge, but uh, he was like, fuck this, I'm getting on the torch. And actually, let's talk real quick here. Uh, he's doing a flame cut to get this open now. And he's basically pulling and pulling and pulling and, and heating a super thin band with a very sharp flame. See that flame is really sharp and driving? And he's just pulling and pulling glass away. That's not what I'd call the cleanest flame cut, but it's not bad. It's like, it looks like a little weird, but that glass will cook right back. He wasn't exactly happy with it. But I really think that if he just kept heating that, it would have cooked back clean enough to be flared but here's an opportunity to see him use these duckbill shears and uh, I'll share like what Robert Mickelson taught me about using these types of shears and it's just like let the flame do the work it's not the shears it's you got to heat that glass beforehand you know what I'm saying so when the glass is hot enough the shears are they you know that that's no big deal so just always makes like and watch him he's gonna cut this section and then he's gonna gonna heat the next section up, so it's really nice and hot. That's one of these tricks here. Don't try and cut too much. You, know, you got to know your limits with these shears. You try and cut too much, and the glass is just gonna be all gross and stressed out and uneven and fucked up. Yeah, you're making like stress stress cracks for it where you don't want it to crack. Yeah, so that's what I would take note of here, you guys. He's just letting the flame do the work. Really heating ahead of where he wants to cut, not cutting anywhere beyond that. And then look at this. A really even lip there now. Beautiful. Yeah. And here he's got his jacks. He had a, a thing of wax there, so he's getting them ready to, to do this with. So they really evened out that, that kink on the back there. That looks really even now. And then now he's, uh, so check it out. He's heating this, and he's really just letting gravity push on that. And here is where that centered handle is so critical. Because really what's happening is that he's heating the lip evenly in theory from, you know, from below and then giving it this little angle into the, the lip or whatever so that it's going to open up, right? But if his handle were not even, the, the force of gravity would not be even. Even if the heat were even and the tool were sitting right, gravity would not be able to affect it evenly. So it's a whole system here whereby that handle is on really straight and he's letting it rest with gravity on those jacks. No, There's no need to push more than that. When the glass is, is... I mean, there's certain times you need to, but in this case, look, he's just gently... Just gently. And look, he's just changing the angle that they're, they're sitting at as, it, as he wants it to open more. But there's no pushing against it, and... Um... If you want to do like a really quick dramatic one, like then you need to kind of whoosh, push, push the glass out, you know. But in this case, he's just wanting it to even and round out and open evenly. So in my mind, that's where he's just letting gravity do that work.
it's not there's not too much middle ground there if you're gonna do that type of flare where it's really hot and and it's almost like uh, like you would do in soft glass where they're just getting the jacks in there and like lifting that wall out really fast and that's what you really need to do when you want when you've got these fit like a thin wall and it all needs to come out and you just it, you've got like one move at it bam this is the type of thing where it's pretty, it's a bit thicker. You've got some time to, to move around and play. And that lip isn't perfect yet, but it's about to be. So and he's going to What's he doing here? Just making sure everything's at the same temperature? I think he is getting it all nice and warm, making sure it's all hot and happy there. Okay. Okay, so um something to keep in mind uh, if the lip isn't flat on the top and, uh, and we're going to watch him do this a bit, it's that if you want it to be flat, right, you're going to flatten it. Okay. But the thing about that is, is that you need to have a significant portion of it. Um, I guess he, I guess he was done there. He was just, just checking it. I guess that was earlier. What we saw him do earlier, I guess we talked right through it. But um, he he heated up a significant portion, like a, like a good bit of the green, and then pushed it down. If you heat just the lip and push it down, you're just going to push that glass into the lip. And it's going to get all thick in certain spots, and it's not going to round out. So if you need to flatten the top, heat a good bit of that down, and, and then give it a flatten. So, it ha so that glass has, a, has somewhere to go, so to speak. And now he's attaching the post where the spoon's going to go. So I got distracted there. The cup is perfect. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> it's third right, place perfect. Oh, I'm wait. grabbing a beer while he puts on that other uh, dot. But these are the two posts. And this spoon's going to have a little curve to it for the handle. So he's going to add them offset. Just something to keep in mind. And I'll be I'll be right back. Carrie, tell them about how, how cool the Jay and Silent Bob show was. Absolutely, yeah. So coming up later after this is over, um, so one of the, the homies at Champs, he got his VIP tickets to the Jay and Silent Bob one night only at the Fremont Country Club down on Fremont Street. I don't know where they call it a country club, but you know, whatever. It was a it was like a theater, a really cool old theater. Maybe old ish, you know, for as old as Vegas is, but we went there and we got free vegan hot dogs. It was an open bar. And then Jay and Silent Bob came on and entertained us for, for a good hour at least or more. And uh, yeah, I think Mike said he's going to share some photos or video from that. He did go live to the group. So if you want to see what Jay and Silent Bob talked about, it is in Source Shock. Yeah, if you search for uh, just like Jay Bob or something like that, it'll come up. I was, we streamed like 45 minutes of probably like an hour or something of them talking. Yeah, it was it was a good time. It, it was, was dope. Definitely entertaining. Yeah. Kevin Smith, you know, Silent Bob is telling stories about his wife, you know, losing it on weed. Yeah. <laughs> all, all kinds of ridiculousness <laughs> and uh, their new movie and the strains that they have coming out. Yeah, it's, supposedly uh, there were joints, but we... Well, we, missed, we, were, we went we out back... Those. So we, we may have missed the distribution of the joints, but they had joints of their, their strains that they have in, in the mix. And guys, maybe some of y'all noticed that Hick Dog was wearing some rings. These are opal rings from the homie Dopals. I thought some of y'all might have been wondering about those. So I, I threw in a quick shot of what those look like because they're really super cool. See, Hick Dog's rocking two of them right now. And, those are pretty uh, sweet. I did just want to show you guys those real quick. Not like in a sponsored thing or anything. He is one of the homies who helps me get to all of these shows, man. Um, I can't, I can't shout out all my sponsors enough. But yeah, those are just some sweet ass fucking rings, man. Uh, big, big shout out to the homie Isaac, man. He he came out to this one, and whenever we zoom out, you see his booth in the background. That Dopal's flag is always rolling around, flying. So yeah, this is the spoon, you guys, and it has kind of, um, I don't know, it's almost like a, like a paisley shape. I, I, I the, the eight-year-old in me wants to be like, yo, it looks like sperm, but, um, <laughs> but, 
the adult in me is going to call it a pigeon. Right. The adult. No, no, but it's 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 this cool um really tapered shape that loops around on the end. It looks really neat actually. Um just the spoon itself here is a, is a really fun shape. So he's um he's cooking this glass in and kind of getting it ready to draw out such that he's got the bowl shape on the end and then this this taper. And he's going to really initiate that the most of the heat is on the end, because that's where he's put it already. And see, so now he's got that heat mostly in the end. You can see where it's really hot. But he wants it, he wants some in there so it flows evenly. Establishing what I would call a dank heat. A tapered dank heat. And here we go, look at that. So that part that he put all that heat into is pulled out and... Got this nice even shape, giving it some tugs as it goes. And then there's this saying, I forget where I really learned it first, but I think it's super true. And it's like the, the first heat is the best heat. That's and what true. that means is that like, if you've got this core and dank heat established in the blank, keep going. See, because he pulled out that shape and now he used that heat that was already in there and he just had to add a bit more and it was already so even and soaked in such that he's then able to do the next part of the loop and now he's got a bunch of heat in that part and he's kind of just letting letting timing pull it around and then something to notice guys is that essentially all of his bends are done upwards he's like pulling it up not like it's like the like the opposite of a rainbow i guess you know what i mean like they're pulling he's pulling it into a smile think of it like that um, when you pull bends like that, gravity is like, um, gravity's not get, like pulling a bunch of material into the middle. If you're pulling it downward, like it, that, that, that's just not a good look. Like the, the more natural way for the, the, is for the material to be able to like droop with, droop with gravity and get pulled, you know, as, as you give it a puff and that should in theory distribute the glass the most even. So you'll notice ver you know, all of his bends, like. Trust me, try try some bends both way and you'll see. You, know, you end up kinking material and all that stuff in the middle of the bend on the bottom is if you do them, if you, you know, make them like a frown. So keep your smiley bends. Keep them shits happy. And yeah, I mean, it, we, we saw it on the main bend and then on the bend here that gave him this this nice, beautiful loop. Same thing, bending it upwards. Just, just making a series of smiles. So he um, he's gonna uh, handle up to this now to do the to blow out the bowl. I thought that was an interesting um, you know it's just all about these different steps of shaping and, and how to get to the next thing right. That's how he did it. You know he gave it this flowing shape that he wanted first, and now he's gonna handle up to the top of the loop where the mouthpiece will be. And now he's going to be able to, to do the bowl push and stuff. So I thought that was clever. That is such a cute paisley. Right? <laughs> I see a new line of pendants for Hick Dog here. Right? <laughs> yeah, Hick Dog's children. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Put my kids around your neck. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, all right. Yes. I told you, there's an eight-year-old in me that is just <laughs> trying to make jokes. He really wants to run this show. Put it on a string of pearls. No, those days are over. <laughs> uh -huh. uh -huh. <laughs> Keeping it serious here for Fireside yeah. Chat. So serious. It's an extremely serious educational broadcast. <laughs> Not for entertainment purposes. Definitely not for children. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. This is all for entertainment purposes. I'm really secretly just here to make you guys laugh. And I thought this was neat. And gave, gave him some gentle heat in there. And then kind of, you know, rounded out that interior bend. Just gently. But he saw that it wasn't uh, perfectly fluid, you know, the way he wants, so... With the right heat and and, and the right uh, push here and there, gets that bad boy looking uh, exactly how and where he wants it. It's 
So yeah, make, making sure it stays off of the tube. You don't want that tagging. But he wants it to kind of flatten in and almost like a conch, you know, like a, comp like a compressed conch and an interior spiral there. And look at that. She's beautiful. And yeah, with the bunts in there, guys, um, this isn't the piece that, you know, truly demonstrates it. But, you know, some of the larger sculptural stuff that he gets up to in these competitions is, you know, where you can see that the Bunsen is, it may not, may not be explicitly necessary, but it offers a tremendous speed advantage and a sense of security. Um... One thing that is kind of uh, an X factor in these competitions, and I've seen it get uh, some of like really experienced guys, is that like the kilns may not be perfect, or somebody left it open too long, or this or that, you know, and all of a sudden a kiln that you expected to be a 1050 is sitting closer to 600, 690, yeah, yeah, something like that, and like that that can just that can be a deal breaker if you you know if you're not able to uh, keep that piece alive, and. Uh, you know, if you've got a really big piece going, man, you you know, you better have like a Delta Mag or something with the annealing flame going because you know, that's what it's going to take. And now here is he's got that the end of uh, this this spoon and he's going to let it kind of uh, kind of just gravity droop and angle down in the angle that he wants and the flow that he wants so that if when it fits around this cup, it, 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 it like sits right and it's like. The angle on it is actually really cool. Like, it really seems to be thought out. Like, it's just right for when you set it down, but then also hit it. It's like it's still sitting upright. It's like at no point is the angle of the bowl such that you're going to drop out your CBD hemp flower that, that I know y'all smoke while we drink our O'Doul's. <laughs> and, uh... Hey, do you think those are Aura lenses that... Uh... Hell no. Aaron? No, no. Are those, those are those are those Phillips with this like coating. Oh, they are the Phillips. Yeah, definitely. No, Mike does Aurelius, the homie, does not have that space age coating. Okay. Yeah. Maybe now you they, know they uh, it's Phillips. it's a cool coating. I'll I uh, I'll give it up. Like it definitely helps reflect stuff. But the downside to that coating is that uh, here he's popping the hole for the bowl, you guys. Um. The downside is that those coatings scratch off really easily. Check it out. Now here's the bull push. And I, I like this shot a lot. I even put in an instant replay. So here's that bull push. We can see it through the bull. Look at that. <laughs> All right. I totally, want, I totally want a soundtrack for that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, gave it another little bit of juice, you know, and gave it an extra push. Don't be a hero on these bull pushes, guys. If it didn't go in the way you want, it's starting to stiffen up, just pull out. You know, get that bad boy hot again, and then go in. And then go in with your hand torch. Always cook those bull marks out. If I owned a head shop, I would rip any bull, anybody out who came, I would rip anybody off who came in with a bull that had tooling marks. I'd be like, oh shit, I can only give you 50 cent for these, man. It's got some, <laughs> some tooling marks on the bull. Like I spent three hours on that. I'm like, I'm sorry, man. It's the buyer's Should've market. Three and you know a half. Saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or even three three hours and five minutes. Yeah. No. Nah. And I'm I'm only I'm only being like slightly facetious here. Like just you know, like God, China is kicking ass these days. Like you can't show up with bowls that have a bunch of stress marks and shit in them. Get out of here with that. You're you're almost like fucking the rest of us over by giving that guy a reason to keep buying China. That guy's going to be like, man, I'm so sick of these local guys coming in here showing me shit that is worse than the stuff I get for pennies. Like, show up proper. Show up with those shits, stress marks cooked out, all that. Then you can get the, the American money. Don't don't show up asking American money for shit that's not even China quality. That's a big issue these days. And I, I know we uh, I have nothing but love for the beginners out there, but we got to have some tough talk sometimes too, you know? They're just you're doing nobody favors showing up with some bullshit. Get that shit right, then show up. All right, here we go. Getting them connected. We don't got to do anything crazy here because one will act as the bridge for the other.
How about that cup? That is a pretty cup. And that pipe is so incognito. The pipe is beautiful. I don't know if I'd call it incognito. It definitely looks like it has some kind of drug device on the side, but... I don't you know, know, it fooled me. I just thought it was a coffee cup. America in 2020, so... <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Like, totally. It reminds me of that, that meme where, like, uh, the... the has got a picture of some secretary, and she's got the, like, China elephant spoon on her desk, you know, like, upside down, and, like, <laughs> I didn't have the heart to tell her it wasn't a ornament. <laughs> Kyle in the house. Big ups, man. He was, uh, you know, some of them of these guys that you see in the background, they're, they're, all, they're all helping out. Um, Mark, all these guys back there. Keeping an eye on the competition, helping competitors with anything that they need, keeping them in the game. Walking around, 30 minutes left. Exactly, yeah, letting everybody know the time limits, answering anybody's questions. These guys are on top of it. Well, you know. Making sure I don't pass them any performance enhancing supplements, that sort of thing. Oh no, you would never. I would never do that. I would never do that. But I do have the special glass blower supplement that I want to mail, make with, you know. I don't know. I just feel like, uh, like all these guys that have a podcast, they all have their like supplement that they sell. You know, you got you got Joe Rogan's got like Alpha Brain or whatever. You know, I need like uh, Alpha Torch. <laughs> <laughs> but for real, uh, the supplement guys, as long as we're fucking around talking about supplements <laughs> there's one that i actually do like um and if i were going to do this and try and rip you guys off for a supplement <laughs> all it would be is this all right Ooh. and it's theanine um l-theanine is the active ingredient in green tea and it's one of the most interesting supplements guys supplements are mostly bullshit they they're very low active they they don't cross the blood brain barrier which is what, like, real drugs do. You know what I'm saying? Uh, theanine does cross the blood-brain barrier and is, like, proven to have an effect on, like, brain waves and put you in a more relaxing state. It's, it's what's in green tea. So it naturally occurs. It's a natural supplement. That's why it's called a supplement. But it's rare in that it actually can get into your brain. Um, it's been a pretty extensively studied uh, and, and is essentially completely benign. Uh, but the interesting thing is that, like I said, it it uh, it's it gives it a, a relaxing effect, a calming effect. Specifically, it counteracts the effects of caffeine. And like I don't know if you guys know about like nootropics or whatever, but these are like brain drugs, you know, and like uh, different chemicals and stacks of chemicals that people believe enhance intelligence and creativity and that sort of thing. And like the, the like the beginner nootropic stack is caffeine and theanine, because theanine relaxes you and and in theory has these benefits of creativity and such potentially, but it also counteracts the negative effects of caffeine, which makes you more alert and has all these positive mental benefits, but has some like negative side you know, um, like you know, the physical shakes, right? yeah physical effects. So like no bullshit. If I were to release a supplement like like Alpha Torch, <laughs> <laughs> it would be theanine. coming soon. It'd be theanine and caffeine, and I'd be all like, "Yo, this stuff increases alertness and makes you more relaxed on the torch and all that." And everybody would be like, "Yo, that shit actually worked, man! I can't believe we pay Mike Mason one hundred and twenty nine ninety five a month for this." <laughs> and I'd be like, "Yo, checking in from my fucking island. This is awesome." But no, oh. you know, I'm not that guy. Uh, I just <laughs> will be I'm more than happy to tell you about this stuff. Don't expect miracles, you guys. It's a supplement. It's not like some drug that, that's going to fucking... It's not like Xanax. But it's um, it's everything I said. It actually crosses the blood-brain barrier. Uh, and, and, you know, puts, it, it helps. Puts you in a relaxing brain waves, whatever all that bullshit is. Um... I think it's worth checking out. You can get Vitamin Shop has a thing of it for like, you know, whatever, 22 bucks, uh, you know, and, and I've recommended it to people with anxiety, stuff like that. I've heard nothing so but positive. So is it more concentrated than just, say, drinking green tea? 
Yes, it's the active ingredient in green tea. So you're taking, you know, green tea might have 50 milligrams, you know, but like you could take 200 milligram dose of it on this and, and really experience the benefits in a positive way that may potentially counteract the effects of caffeine and such. And here he is, guys, opening holes. You don't really need me to tell you how to open a hole, do you? Now, um, but yeah, I like that reamer that he's got there with like the super tiny brass on one side and then the super, uh, the bigger one on the other side. And there it is. There's the mouthpiece. Um, but anyways, yeah, I think theanine is an interesting one. Like I said, I've recommended it to homies over the years who deal with anxiety and that sort of thing. And it doesn't, it's not a miracle thing, but it's natural and it takes the edge off. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's positive and you guys might like, might give it a try. Like I said, it's not putting no money in my pocket, but that is the joke that I make though. Like everybody's got their fucking supplement. They got to try and cash in on and shit. And that's not my vibe. But, uh, <laughs> just give it, give it a bing, especially if you guys are like the caffeine type, you know, you get a little shaky and all that, like that, 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 that can actually really knock out some of the negative side effects of caffeine. Like that, that's, that's what it's really done for a lot of people. So, all right, enough about theanine, but I, I do think it's, it's interesting and, and worth a moment. How, how about that cup? Look at that eye in there, you guys. Is, is mm -hmm. that cool or what? There's the Griffin finishing tools. Rocking the OG hat, the homie uh, Dustin Amato, that's his business. Official genius. Whenever I wear those hats, people always look at it and they all think I'm like some kind of asshole. They're all like, oh, huh, official genius, huh? And it's like, look, it's my friend's company. I don't care what you think of me. So, you know, type of deal. Of course I'm the official genius. Yeah. Why would you question that? Here he is knocking that handle off stressed Ooh. it stress snapped it yeah. and now he's uh just gonna cook that bottom and remove the excess and and be be done with it and this in my mind you know i was mentioning earlier how like i really strongly and me and a bunch of cats that i know prefer the uh, hot seal on the bottom of these cups to get them open ahead of the finish um because the cold seal there, even if it's just to get the mouth open and, you know, be done with it, you, like I said, you've got about 10 seconds before that bad boy wants to crack your whole cup from the bottom up. That sucks. That really sucks. So, the notion here is that you do it just like this, you know, or put that bad boy into some grabbers. However you like to finish your cup is fine. It's just the idea is to, you know, we're just just remove that hot seal at the end and reflatten it. And that's really so much safer than trying to do the cold seal trickery and stuff. Um, you know, I know like these Venetian bosses will do it, you know, especially when they open the cups and they'll they'll attach to like the bottom of the um the where like the avolio or what like basically where the foot connects to the to the piece. They'll go right in there, man. Like, it's just risky. If you don't need to, go ahead and do that hot seal and then just take that extra time and do what we just saw here. And in we go. And yeah, there's dopples in the background, chilling out with Lisa's Pieces. We actually have some footage of Lisa's Pieces demo from the Melton Richmond. The homie white fire was out there. There's that cup, you guys. Look at that. How cool is that? That Millie in the middle. Awesome. Really, really awesome cup. And then, guys, check it out. This is uh, the coffee maker. This is a sneak preview of, of what you'll see in the future here. But that top piece has the same Encalmo design. I did an, an amazing matching Encalmo foot lid for the top part. And then every bit of this he made, um, and then here, check it out. Look at this condensation forming on on the uh, the the flask or whatever the beaker rather. I don't know what is that a flask? It's a beaker. I think of it as a flask. Oh, these weed like heads that. got me confused, man, because they call the beaker bong, you know that, but. Oh, it's really a flash. Oh, we're not talking. Yeah, no. See, so yeah, okay. exactly. Okay, so check it out. 
This is while the water gets hot and boils. You can just watch the crowd go by. Look at all the whoop. There it goes. Bam, and now we're... All right, so we shut the shut the, the thing off now that it started boiling. You can see the water is up here just doing its thing, naturally percolating, as it were. And then here it goes. Now that it's co cooling down, the, the pressure is changing rapidly. So the pressure, the vapor pressure in there was such that that water was like forced its way up to the top. But now it's cooled down again, so it's coming back to... That's where it lived before it boiled, right? So of course it's going to come back down and hang out. Now that it's cooled down. And here it comes. Oh yeah, coffee. This is about what I have to do every day here in Nebraska. <laughs> Perry does not have an automatic coffee maker, so like every day I gotta wait for the water to boil and then pour it over the drip thing. It's good coffee, don't get me wrong. It's a better way of making coffee, but you know, I'm just a degenerate who wants to throw some shit in a Black & Decker and come back to my pot of coffee. So, you no, know, a little difference there. All right, and there this thing is, yo, and it's like a pot of awesome coffee. Like I said, this thing gets coffee to just the right temperature, like the classic extraction temperature. And then when it comes down, and here's Tony Casey, the homie, giving it the sample, the Folgers look. The best part of the yeah. All right, multi All right. This is like a you know, shot glass pipe, pipe that can do your dishes, you know. Anything feed the dog. So multifunction. Third place goes to. Third place of multifunction goes to um, the, the 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 coffee new coffee maker guy. Hey dog. He's a barista now. He's a barista glass blower. He's got dark and light coffee. Right? Jeez. Man, every year Double medal winner, I mean, he's throwing the game up. You know you should be in the Masters too. So yeah, thought I'd leave you guys in the audio with the uh, the master of the games there, Matty White. Shout outs to the homie. Um and yeah, shout outs again to the to these companies uh, and you guys out there who are pitching in. It really makes it possible for me and Carrie to get to these shows. Um, you know, we'll meet you guys the other rest of the way, you know, and stand and break our backs filming the shit. And we love it. But these companies are the ones who help us get there in the first place. So, um, yeah, little like uh, a viewer, viewer mail segment here or whatever, right? <laughs> like... Uh, and guys, we got some sweet ass giveaways to do here shortly. So uh, once this is done, we'll jump into that and we'll pick some numbers. I've got some awesome stuff to give away. But if you'll just indulge me, I will. Uh, I will take one moment to to kind of. Uh...